Equipment sitting in the corner collecting dust. Why? Well, maybe no, nobody knows how to use it right. Maybe it's not right for your practice. Maybe it is right, and you just need to market it or take another course. So the truth about adding hair restoration to your practice, hair transplants are not one size fits all. So today I am going to introduce you to somebody very special, Spencer Coburn, who's the author of The Bald and True. And he will tell you how hair transplants are not one size fits all. They're not for everybody. And as I learned, it's more men than women, but it's about hair loss. It's about receding hair. And are you a good candidate? Are you going to the right physician or the right provider? All of that you'll learn a little bit today, but surgery is a team effort. And if you wanna be successful in anything that you do, it's all about education. It's all about ongoing training. It's all about education. And it's how you perceive yourself. How are you willing to handle what is going on in your surgical procedures? Are you doing it? Are you having somebody else do it? Well. Today, Beautiful Forever University is excited to be here. I'm Cheryl Whitman, and I am going to introduce you in a minute to somebody who's very special, Spencer Coburn, who is the author of The Bold Truth. I love the title, I think it's great. And it's the first complete guide to preventing hair loss. Well, maybe I should read it myself because my hair is you know, receding a little. Um, and he started the American Hair Loss Association. Okay, well, do we belong? I don't know. We got to find out about joining. Um, and then there's a Hair Restoration Summit 2020 coming up, which I'm really excited to be part of. And um, he's the author of the bestseller. And um, he's very well known. I speak to all hair restoration physicians. We set up hair clinics within practices, some surgical, some not surgical. And Spencer is a contributor to Consumers Digest and WebMD. Um, and it goes on and on. He has an amazing background. So I would like to introduce you to Spencer and we're going to talk today about the truth. We're not here to sell you hair restoration. We might be here to talk you out of it if it's not right for you, but we want you to be open and listen. And we're gonna talk about hair restoration um, surgery. So, um, so Spencer, I'm so happy you're here today. Cheryl, thank you so much for having me. How are you today? Doing great, thank you. So you are the pro, you're a non-physician. So let me start with saying that because most of the people I interview are physicians. So right. of course they view things differently than you and I as consultants. Um, so we're sitting in a different position to be able to educate, train um, our, our physicians or providers. So the hair restoration surgery um, is the fastest way to destroy an online reputation um, if you offer it and you really don't know how to perform it. And I guess that would go across the board with any surgical procedure. With this procedure, I know that you can make a lot of money if you do it right. And I know you're here today to tell us the pros and cons on hair restoration and, um, and hair surgery. Is there anything you want to add to that before we go to the next slide? Yeah, well, I, I will tell you this, that, um, you know, surgical hair restoration is an incredibly and probably one of the most underrated uh, but most elegant and nuanced and difficult forms of cosmetic surgery that exists. Every aspect of the procedure from removing the grafts, grafts to handling the grafts to placing the grafts to designing the hairline, you know, you're essentially only, the result is only as good as the weakest link uh, in your team. And every aspect of the surgery counts for the end result. And you're essentially moving live organs from the back of the scalp to the front of the scalp. So it's a very complicated procedure. Unfortunately, it's been sold as a commodity uh, essentially since the inception of the industry. And what a lot of plastic surgeons and other cosmetic surgeons uh, think when they get into this field is that this is a nothing procedure. It's really easy. I'm just going to buy a turnkey device. I'm going to put it in, the, in another room, let some people um, perform the surgery for me. And I'm just going to turn out, you know, a $10,000 or $20,000 bill every day as ancillary income. And that's not the case. And you said something interesting. I can tell you that there are plastic surgeons who have gotten in, into this field who chose not to really learn about it and they hired the wrong people. Um, that surgery is performed under their practice's name, and now they are kind of trying to uh, chase their online reputation and save it after unhappy patients came out and said, 
this guy destroyed my life. And it wasn't even his fault. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty important thing that people understand that you can make a lot of money. It's a great procedure, but you have to know something about it. And I think that goes across the board with any of the surgical and non-surgical procedures. But with hair, from the way that I understand it and the way that hair grows, it's going to take a year for somebody to realize that somebody might have screwed up or that there is some damage. It might not be immediate. So how does that play into this whole picture? Well, that's the problem. You know, a lot of guys will purchase a device and they'll have the surgery performed in their clinic and they will sell and market surgeries. And then six months down the line, you have, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 unhappy patients. And they don't understand that, they don't realize that, you know, adjustments needed to be made because they weren't really involved in the procedure and they were relying on the per diem technicians or whomever to perform the procedure, again, under the auspices of their license. So that's, that's a big problem. And, you know, we have been able to evolve the industry to a point, or we were, from 1998 to about 2006, to the point where it, it was a completely undetectable natural procedure. Now things have kind of turned, um, you know, back to, seeing a lot of pluggy work, a lot of bad angles, a lot of really unhappy patients. And simply, you know, the reason why that's happening is simply because, you know, guys are being sold a bill of goods by these product manufacturers. And all they have to do is take a little time to learn. I mean, it's not for everybody. I mean, I know some physicians that have purchased machines and then afterwards said, oh my God, I want immediate results. Well, when you bought the machine, you should have realized the hair does not grow immediately. Right. Um, the, other, the other big thing is, you know, women. I know that, you know, like you talked about, the grafts are taken from the back of the hair, and some women, it's just not a possibility. So not everybody is a candidate. Um, yeah. Very few do a lot of women, um, where women do need it. There are eyelashes, eyebrows, receding hairlines, but we're not all candidates. So I think having the right uh, provider, the right candidate, and being honest. I mean, there are non-surgical alternatives, which we're not going to get into today, but that can lead up to a procedure. Um, as a consultant in the industry, one of the things that we were always told from the manufacturers um, was that, oh, this is tech-driven. You can hire a tech. We have a tech team. Um, and I'm like, well, then why doesn't the tech team just bring their own equipment? Why does somebody have to lay out $100,000 or more um, for equipment if the techs are going to come and do it anyway. So, right. I mean, you know, I'm sure you hear that. How do you handle that when, you know, a physician calls you and says, well, I don't need to learn it because it's tech driven and the techs, but it's under my license. So, well, here, here, here's the thing, it, at least here in the state of California, it, the state medical board recently uh, made a declarative statement that um, it is not within a medical technician's scope of practice to perform this surgery. And uh, essentially, if someone were to complain to the state about a physician who is using technicians, they could be sanctioned. So it is essentially illegal, and it's illegal in, in a lot of states, well, in some states. With that said, you know, a lot of these technicians have tremendous experience. And like you said at the, at the beginning of your, in your opening, Hair transplantation is a team effort. So if you have the right team, whether the technicians or whether they're actual medical professionals like nurses or PAs, the key is to utilize that team um, at, to, to not only help to train yourself if you decide to buy one of these devices, but you are essentially, you have to become the captain of that ship. And if you don't know every aspect of the surgery and what that team is doing, then you are unable to see the mistakes that are happening. So yes, are these device makers promoting the fact that this is a tech-driven procedure? Absolutely. Should it be? Well, I mean, that really depends on who you ask. But the bottom line is whether it's tech-driven or whether you, know, you hire PAs or nurses, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know the mistakes that are being made. And it's your name that's on the line, not theirs. They just move on to the next doc. They're making their money and you're dealing with unhappy patients and uh, possibly a really bad reputation online. 
Yeah, and that's one thing that you don't want because most of the physicians can't sleep at night if they have some negative reviews um, and it's very hard to turn those around. Well, I'm gonna be clear, and this is not to turn people off because I think this is, this is a life-changing procedure. I mean, this, and if you do it well, and if you really enjoy it, um, you know, a lot of physicians, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out what their ROI is and they want ancillary income. This shouldn't be ancillary income. This should, if you're going to make this a part of your practice, it should be a, a relatively big part of your practice. Um, but, you know, and I just lost my train of thought, but you said something interesting at the beginning that this is not a one size fits all procedure and that not everyone is a candidate. And you mentioned women. The reality is most women are not candidates for hair transplant surgery because they suffer from diffuse hair loss, unlike men who have a stable donor area. With that said, five, maybe 10% of women who are dealing with androgenetic alopecia and other types of hair loss can make good candidates. So choosing or patient selection is key. And I know guys who really focus on women in their practice, both with eyebrows, eyelashes, and with hair, but they understand how to choose that patient so they're able to thrive. And, and that makes sense. And that comes with part of the whole education and the training. You know, it's interesting. I didn't think of it till you just said the word donor. So I'm wondering, so let's say I'm a woman and I want to have this done, but my hair is not the right hair. Can I get hair from a donor? I mean, is that something that even exists? No, it's just, it's just like any other organ transplant. If you were to um, have their organs transplanted to your scalp, you would have to take anti-rejection medication. So uh, the risk is certainly not worth the reward when it comes to, to hair transplantation, and no one would do it. Okay. And it, there, are, so, there are cases with identical, uh, identical twins where it's worked, but otherwise it won't work. Your, the hair would be rejected. That's interesting. I never thought of it till just now when you use the word donor um, site. Um, that made me think of that. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a team, and sometimes – when we go into practice as consultants, whatever it's for, it could be for anything, hiring staff, training staff, setting up or expanding into creating a hair clinic or a vein clinic or whatever it is that they want to do. Um, the staff is not the right staff. So what I tend to find is that when we talk about the team, it's not only the surgical team, but it's a team that also does the consults and the follow-up and the follow-through because it seems like there's a, a long time frame here that you have to do hand-holding between yeah. selling products, selling of nutraceuticals, topicals, um, post-op care. So how do, you, how do you see that when it comes to the human resources and who's working in, let's say, an internal medicine doctor's clinic now who now wants to expand and do hair restoration? Well, all, all I can say is this, and I kind of come from another, the other side of the field, and I, I really have focused in, in hair for the last 23 years. But when a guy walks into, and, and I, I deal with mostly men, when someone walks into and, and is considering having a hair transplant surgery, they develop a kind of like a, a psychological equation. And every aspect of that equation counts as far as how they're gonna react to the end result. And I'll give you for instance, if you email the clinic and they have kind of like a lackluster response or just a kind of like a, a, a generic email, um, that can turn some people off. But if they continue to follow through with the process and have a consultation, and maybe the consultation's okay, but the doctor didn't have a great bedside manner, or the front desk person had a little bit of an attitude that day, or so on and so forth down the line, but the patient ends up with a stellar result, he's not even going to think about that. That's going to be all out the window. However, if that all occurs and the patient ends up with even a good result, but it's mediocre, it didn't meet his expectations, all hell is going to break loose. This guy's going to think that he was butchered. And, you know, we did a survey through the American Hair Loss Association about, I don't know, maybe it was about four or five years ago. And I think there was about 2,600 people who were surveyed. And um, one of the bit main reasons for people to sign to complain online was not necessarily because they felt the result was so terrible. It was really about how they were managed. And if they had a problem, there was no follow-up. And the fact that they didn't have the physician's cell phone number after the procedure. You know, when you're dealing with hair loss, um, it's kind of a different animal. And I would say that I'm not saying it's more relevant than someone who wants to get breast augmentation. But when you are getting a hair tra transplant surgery, you know, essentially when you lose your hair, 
as your hairline erodes, so part of your self-esteem erodes, and you are trying to regain something that you once had. You're not just trying to augment your appearance. So there's a, a much deeper psychological impact, and a lot, especially on men who are going through this, uh, than most doctors realize. And if you don't handle these patients really gingerly, that alone can get you really bad reviews. And I've seen it countless times. So you make some good points. You know, I don't deal with who to hire for front office, you know, people and all these other things. I basically just let these guys understand the psychology of these patients and what they need to do uh, in order to hold their hands and the information they need before they decide to enter into this field as far as surgical devices, what kind of team they need and stuff like that. And, you know, it's interesting because in the whole plastic surgery, cosmetic, medical, spa business, um, there is a big difference between how you handle and treat men opposed to women, um, how you sell, how you follow up. Um, all of those things are really important. I often talk about them um, and write about it because most practices, remember, in the med spa cosmetic arena, we're 90% women. Right. So it's really a very different way of, like you said, treating a man and working with the men um, than it is working and dealing with women, which they're used to dealing with every day. Men need more education in this arena. There's no question about I, it. I understand about men is, you know, it's one thing once we start to lose our hair, we're embarrassed and we're almost ashamed to talk about it or to disclose that we're concerned about it. But then to go and have cosmetic surgery and try to correct that, there's a, a, even a greater psychological impact than I think some women have when they go in to have cosmetic surgery. There is a stigma to this day, even though it's changing, it's lifting a little bit for men. Um, but when it comes to hair, I mean, we're just supposed to kind of like man up and not talk about it, not worry about it, but it really affects guys, um, their, their psyches. And I, I've known guys who've called my program who've changed their career paths because they've had bad hair transplants. They were attorneys who are now, and there's one guy who calls the show, he decided to buy a potato, tri ch uh, potato chip route in New York uh, so he could wear a hat instead of doing what he trained for and what he studied for, and that was being an attorney. It's, it's very interesting because, you know, even, um, well, many years ago there was a study done and maybe there was something more recent that I'm just not up on um, about how long it actually takes a man to make a decision to go and send that email, make that phone call, go for the consult. You know, when women see a line, when we see gray hair, when we see something that we don't like, immediately we're on the phone or we're in the office, you know, that week. Um, but it's not the same for men. So tell us what, you know, what's happening now in, in, you know, overall in the industry. Well, things are changing a lot. I mean, social media has changed things. The fact that there is so much more access to physicians who are performing this procedure. Uh, the fact that people are scrolling through their, if they, if they have researched it at all on their phones or, you know, on their laptops, when they're scrolling through their Instagram feeds, they're seeing ads for hair transplant surgery. It is looked at as a commodity on social media. So, you know, it's almost like the psychology has changed to the point where guys now think it's like going to whiten their teeth or to, you know, they're going to a spa. So it doesn't appear to them like it's cosmetic surgery. So they're a little more apt to pick up the phone or to send an email. With that said, that's why it's so much more dangerous than it's been in the last 20 years, because most of what these guys are doing is they're going for the cheapest special. Uh, they're seeing $2 graphs being promoted. Uh, they are, they were before the pandemic, um, you know, traveling overseas and getting really inexpensive hair transplants that were performed by God knows who, just because the price is right. So while more people are certainly interested and willing to make that call and to consider having surgery earlier on in their hair loss, um, the education is just so, I mean, it's, it's just so much misinformation on the internet that it's much more dangerous that the market, as the market grows, it's just become much more dangerous. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And I guess that's true, you know, with hair, um, for sure. I mean, people did talk for a long time, as you said, 
you know, about going to Turkey. That's supposed to be like the number one place. I actually talked to somebody in Israel the other day um, and they said from Israel, people are going to Turkey because it's inexpensive. You can get a lot done fast and cheap um, and there are some great results. Well, they didn't have it done so they could say they were great results. I haven't spoken to the people who went to Turkey. Um, I, I can tell you this, there are maybe seven or eight legitimate clinics. It could be a little bit more now. Uh, in Turkey, guys are doing really great work and I feel bad for them because they have to compete against these hair mills. Essentially, they have rooms lined up with the tourists, you know, people traveling from Saudi Arabia or, or you know, places in the Middle East and in Europe and UK to have inexpensive hair transplants. They could have 10 people in a room with just young girls essentially performing surgery like they're working in a sweatshop. And people's lives are, are literally being destroyed. You know, the one thing about, if you have a bad rhinoplasty, usually, you know, if it's not horrendous, it could, you know, th there's a chance you could be corrected. If you have a botched boob job, there's a good chance you, you could be corrected. If you have a botched hair transplant where they move a lot of hair, several thousand grafts, that hair is done. You have a finite amount of hair that can be moved. And once you're permanently scarred, that's it. You are destroyed. There's no coming back from that. And that's what consumers don't understand. And sadly, it's what a lot of physicians who are getting into the field don't understand. I always advise physicians who are getting into the field not to offer large sessions. Make sure that you're doing something that's reasonable as far as you know the amount of grafts that are being moved. So if there's a problem, there's enough donor hair in the bank where it could be corrected. Um, and this is stuff that is really not taught to most of the new physicians and plastic surgeons who are getting into the field. Um, you know, a lot of these companies work in, on a, a kind of a, uh, it, it's a, it's a per graft game where it's like a, for every attempt, you have to pay the product manufacturer for that graft. So, Product manufacturers want you to perform more surgery and then place more grafts. And the physicians think that's the way to do it anyway because you're making money, uh, more money per graft. So it's a, it's a slippery slope. And there's a lot of options out there now more than ever. I mean, there's everything from the old fashioned small machines and the handheld to robots that, right. that people are just like in awe over. Um, and I've seen it go up and down, you know, with the industry and with the, the price that was like, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars or whatever it was at that time. Um, so, I mean, just in general, um, how do you see the industry's um, equipment evolving and changing? Or that's not necessary. It's really just more education and more training that's needed. I can tell you this, that the evolution of the equipment is very minimal. You know, essentially what you're doing when you're doing follicular unit extraction, when you're removing one graft at a time, you're using some sort of a punch device. Um, it could be, like you said, motorized, a handheld motorized device, or it could be just a, a very small 0.8 millimeter punch, and you're going in there manually and removing that hair. So while all of these devices seem really sexy, the sexy part is, in some cases, in, in my view, the ability to market yourself better. So, you know, just to give full disclosure, uh, I consulted for Restoration Robotics for two years, and my job was to A, help them have their finger on the pulse of the consumer, and to potentially improve uh, their device and how they are educating the physicians who are purchasing this device. And I can tell you that the technology is certainly impressive. And I believe that robotics should be a part of the future of this field. But what I tell doctors who are getting into the field now is that you don't have to make a huge investment to learn if you want to be in this field. You can hire the same staff, you can hire, you know, the right techs and, you know, or PAs to teach you how to do it. And you can buy a less expensive piece of equipment and then eventually graduate onto more expensive pieces of equipment where you're working with a company that might help market your practice. And I kind of think that makes sense for physicians. Well, physicians who I speak to and consult with, it makes a lot of sense to them because A, 
their savings here are in fifty thousand uh, dollars. They they get a chance to see whether or not they like being in hair, and then if they decide six months down the road or or ten months down the road that they want to get a robot or whatever they get, then they understand what it's like to be a hair transplant surgeon and they make that investment. I mean, it, all all of what you're saying makes sense. Um, and, you know, I guess, Spencer, you know, if somebody's listening to this or somebody's going to listen to it after today um, and they're interested in learning more um, about the industry overall, I know that you have all the top experts in the world speaking at your hair restoration uh, global summit 2020. Right. Um, so where can they go to sign up for that? And when is it? Okay. Well, they can go to globalhairloss2020.org. Uh, and right now it's scheduled to, to go live October 1st to the 3rd. And I will tell you this, I mean, it's growing so rapidly. We are now up to, we just added two more faculty. We're up to 109 faculty. Wow. Um, so it's definitely going to be a, an intense summit. But what we're going to be providing everyone with is really the reality, not just the science, which is incredibly important, but the reality of the field, the business of hair as well. Uh, what to avoid, and all the, the entire scope and all the possible pitfalls of getting into this field, and what you need to know to really be successful if you choose to go in this direction. And I want to make it clear that I have no issue with someone going out and purchasing, purchasing what's called one of these turnkey devices, because some of these devices are, you know, you're really only, the device is only as good as the hand that wields it, and that goes for the robot as well, because you have to physically set those parameters within the device to make it work well. So you have to know what you're doing as well. So whatever device you choose um, to, to purchase, whether it's a, you know, a $30 punch or a $10,000 piece of equipment or $250,000 piece of equipment, the key is to really understand the, all the nuances of this discipline. And if you understand that, you'll be able to make more uh, a more educated decision in moving forward. And I think a lot of doctors are not given that, you know, uh, given that opportunity when they're just being met by salespeople in their offices. Well, I think your virtual summit is a great idea and I think they'll learn a lot from it. Um, there was something that somebody had sent in a question um, earlier and it's not in front of me now, but basically the question was there are some companies that are offering to come into your practice and you have nothing to do with it. You just be the medical director and they would send people in to do the services, maybe even send in a physician with the techs. Um, what do you think about that? If you were a plastic surgeon and you wanted to offer it, but you really knew that it wasn't your thing. I can say that there's no company that will send the physician with okay. the techs. It's all going to be tech driven. So yes, there are companies out there that will, offer that. And there are physicians out there who are willing to pay to, to make that happen. And then they're not only paying for the device, but they're also partnering with the company. So every procedure that's performed, the company essentially gets a piece. Um, which, you know, as, as an entrepreneur myself, uh, and as a long time, you know, uh, person who's been in business for himself since he's been 19 years old, uh, Personally, I don't think it's a great idea, but for some people that works. But as far as having control of what's happening in your clinic and the fact that these people are working under the auspices of your license, I wouldn't be comfortable with it, you know, to be honest with you. And um, I think that it's not a wonderful idea. Now, you also have to see what the legality is in your particular state, province, or anywhere you are in the world of making that happen. But yeah, um, companies are offering that. It's a great business model for them. I'm not 100% convinced that's a great business model for physicians. Okay, and, that, and that's fair. You know, also somebody was asking about what is the average price? And I know it goes by the number of graphs, so there's no average. It's not like a facelift average that might be $20,000. But I mean, the, the ticket items are high. I mean, you're talking 10 to what, $30,000 for hair transplants? It depends on the number of graphs, but I would say it averages about $12,000 per procedure. And you have to understand that patient will normally need a minimum of two procedures. 
So if you do well for that patient, they're guaranteed to come back. If you don't, they're going to go to someplace else to try to get repaired. So yeah. that, that's, you know, something else that I want to drive home is it's vital for these doctors who are getting involved in this to understand that you're not, this isn't just a one-time ticket item. You don't want to just turn them in and, and you know, and, and, and have like a uh, revolving door. You want to develop a relationship with this patient because once he's a happy patient, he's your hair patient for life. And hair loss is a progressive disease. Even if you are using medication to slow the progression, it probably will eventually progress. So it may be five years before you see that patient again, but if he's happy, he'll be back. And that could end up being, you know, you, you could end up doing fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of surgery on the guy. Wow. I mean, that's, that's very common. Yeah. And, you know, men overall are more loyal patients in our arena of the medical aesthetic world anyway. So, you know, if they build this relationship and bond and they're happy, I could see that they obviously are going to come back, maybe even tell their friends, depending on how conservative they are about talking. There, about there's no doubt. Not only would they come back, they would tell their friends and they would go online and they would, you, they would become an advocate. Uh, even if it's anonymous, an advocate for this physician. You know, hair transplant surgery is so life-changing for a guy. I have seen guys who initially were very quiet about it, who are now, I mean, they'll tell anybody because it looks so natural when it's done well that they almost feel proud like they made it, they made the right decision. So, yeah, I mean, but on the flip side, as loyal as they are, um, if you screw them, it's bad news. Guys could be really vicious on the internet. It would, it would take them a year to figure out that, that things were messed up. I mean, it's not going to happen immediately, correct? It depends. I mean, if, if they, you know, a lot of times what happens is a guy will have an experience, may not be the best experience uh, during the day. Maybe, and I'll give you a for instance, maybe uh, he's having surgery and the technicians are talking about going out drinking the night before. I mean, this happens. And this is in his head. And he's worried about how the surgery is coming is gonna is gonna come out. So he goes online and he looks up that doctor and he may find four complaints where that he never saw before. And then he starts to freak out. And then the doctor's office is getting a call every day for the next two weeks. That's the way it works. So that's why I always tell these guys that the experience is so important. And you know, it you have to watch what's happening in your practice. If you're just hiring strangers to come into your practice to perform surgery, I mean, this is real surgery under the auspices of your license and you're not watching them and you don't know what's going on in that room. I mean, you're certainly not, uh, you know, being a, uh, a, a responsible business person, let alone a physician. And somebody's asking a question about Bosley because they were probably one of the first, I guess, to advertise and to really get the word out there, um, at least that I'm aware of, and whoever else is asking the question. Um, and they're asking about Bosley. I mean, I haven't seen commercials lately, but I guess I'm watching too much Netflix <laughs> now that I'm staying yeah. in. I'm watching series at night. But um, so they're asking about Bosley and they're asking, you know, how those physicians that they're hiring and their results. What do you see and how do you compare them to the independent practices that you're dealing with? Well, I want to make it clear that Bosley has evolved tremendously. Um, the, um, uh, the, main, the president of the Bosley, Ken Washenik, has done an incredible job over the last 15 years of really getting Bosley to where it should be as far as um, having the ability to provide state-of-the-art hair transplant surgery. With that said, you know, this is a business that essentially spends big money to get leads. And that money needs to be converted. Those leads need to be converted into sales and into surgery. So I think that it's pretty difficult. You know, there, well, to answer your question directly, there are some really good doctors who really care about what they're doing, who work under the umbrella of Bosley, who are contracted by Bosley. And there are some who aren't quite as good. So you really can't go by the reputation of a firm or a big company. You have to go by the reputation of the individual physician. You can get a great hair transplant from Bosley. You could also get a really bad hair transplant from Bosley, just like any place else. But um, 
I'm not a fan of the large chain clinics. And while I have a great relationship with Ken Warshenik, and uh, I would certainly, you know, have no problem taking a closer look at some of their physicians at some point, you know, that's the company that's really commoditized surgery or hair transplant surgery. And um, I don't necessarily think that was a great thing. But I just, again, I want to state they've come a long way and there's a lot of happy patients that come out of their practice. And I think they brought awareness to men because I guess they were playing their ads at the right time when the men are watching football games or sports, you know, or um, the Sunday sports section, they would put ads. Um, so I guess, you know, they obviously knew their target audience. Um, and from what I understand, the consults are not even being done by a physician. The consults are being done by just somebody working there. And the day they show up is the day they meet the physician. Unless that has changed, um, I didn't have to answer this question. I figured I'd give it to you. Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty common, uh, unfortunate, common occurrence in the field, which has a set, uh, eventually it's, it's actually moved on to the mainstream cosmetic surgery arena as well. Um, I think it's okay for a patient to get a basic education, an idea of what the cost might be uh, from a hair transplant consultant or salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is real medicine and it's real surgery. And if, if the physician cannot take 15 minutes or 20 minutes to sit down with you and give you a, a really um, thorough medical consultation and surgical consultation, then I say you walk. That's a, it's a really bad idea, but it's pretty common. It's commonplace. And really, you know, Bosley and other chain clinics kind of built that model where they had sales associates and, you know, and again, things have evolved. They have evolved as well. It's not what it was in the eighties and the nineties and even the early two thousands. But, you know, if I'm going to have such a life changing cosmetic procedure, and we're not talking about something you could hide with a shirt if it goes wrong, this is front and center. This is your hair. Mm -hmm. And if it looks slightly off, I mean, you're uncomfortable for the rest of your life. Um, and it's something, unfortunately, that's kind of like the last bastion of, pol of political incorrectness where people can still goof on somebody with a bad hair transplant or, or you know, it's, it's, it really is an emotional thing for people. So to get more to your question, if you're asking this question, I don't know, but I'll answer it the way that I think it should be answered. I'm not a fan. And if you're going to have cosmetic surgery, you need to be able to have a con consultation with an actual physician. And I'm in agreement with that. I mean, if I would go for any kind of procedure, I'd want another doctor, build a relationship, and be able to know I can trust them, and they'll be there when I come back if I have questions. So I guess that definitely answers the question. And, um, and I, at Beautiful Forever University, um, which is sponsoring um, all of this, we're all about education. So if somebody wants to learn more about how to set up a hair clinic, again, surgical, non-surgical, we can help them turn key to do that. Um, whether it's, you know, trichologist, prescription medication, you know, over the counter shampoos and, um, and treatments. Um, there are a lot of alternatives and not everybody's always ready for surgery. So right. we set up these clinics that are retail um, oriented for products, but also somebody is there to take care of them. And it can build and grow into an upsell and a cross sell into a surgical procedure ultimately. Um, and if the physician is not ready to do it or doesn't feel that this is the right thing for them, they can build a relationship. Um, it's almost like a dermatologist building a relationship with a plastic surgeon that they might refer three or whatever number to. It could be the same thing here. Um, and the same thing with hair salons. We've dealt with a lot of hair salons and have built programs um, to deal with hair restoration physicians. Um, that they can learn from because they don't know anything more than selling somebody a shampoo that's over the counter to say, okay, this can make your hair thicker. We know it doesn't, especially if it's being sold in a salon, you know, over the counter. But, you know, people are desperate. And who do you talk to but your hairdresser? So that's obviously a whole other um, story. But I really look forward to, um, to being part of your summit. And um, thank you so much for your time today. 
and your knowledge. Um, and, um, and it's great. We'll have to have you back to talk about so many of these other things that we touched on but didn't have time to talk to about today. Absolutely, Cheryl. I appreciate it. I, I look forward to your presentation at the Global Hair Loss Summit. Thank you. And um, this is great. And I really appreciate you taking the time to interview me. Well, that was great. I, I think it was wonderful. And it was nice getting to know you even more. Um, and I look forward to continuing and having you back for Beautiful Purple University to maybe educate some of the physicians or the providers even a little bit further. So I thank Absolutely. you for a great day. Okay, you take care. So today we 